One of the great joys of my life has been encountering poetry. I'm Dr. Tim Winters, and I teach ancient Greek and Latin at Austin P. State University in Clarksville, Tennessee. And yes, I think you should learn ancient Greek and Latin, and I'll be happy to tell you why if you'll send me an email note. But today I want to talk to you about something other than ancient Greek. I have been reading and memorizing poetry all of my life, and I still have some of those poems I memorized as a boy rattling around in my head today. So here, for example, is the opening of Longfellow's poem, Evangeline. I had to memorize a bunch of this poem when I was in eighth grade. It goes like this. This is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, bearded in moss, in garments green, indistinct in the twilight, Stand like druids of eld with voices sad and prophetic. Stand like harpers whore with beards that rest on their bosoms. It goes on and on for over a thousand lines. That's amazing image, that, that image of the trees as sort of personified has sort of stuck with me through my whole life. Poetry can be a source of great joy, can deepen our understanding of who we are, not only as individuals, but also as members of a much larger sort of historical society. We all share human experience, of course, and poetry is one way that we can appreciate that, that experience a bit more sharply. Poets regularly uh, also refer to one another. So the more that we know about the poetic tradition, the more enjoyment and understanding we gain from our reading. So for instance, that little bit from uh, from Evangeline, uh, in that uh, poem, Longfellow was concerned to signal to his readers that he was wanting to develop a, a poetic tradition for America. He did that by returning to the first piece of literature we have in the Western canon. The very uh, beginning of our literature comes from Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and those poems are written in dactylic hexameter. So Longfellow took that meter and used it for his poem as a way of saying to his readers, I'm laying the foundation here. Literature in general allows us to do what is at the heart of the liberal arts. It allows us to free ourselves from the boundaries of time and space and enter into what Mortimer Adler called the great conversation. Liberal uh, comes from the Latin word for free, and the arts, theater, music, art, history, literature, foreign languages, philosophy, they allow us to roam freely throughout time and space in that endless conversation with all sorts of interesting minds. That's why one simply must scribble in the margins of books. As one of my former colleagues used to say, reading is more than just passing print in front of one's eyes. Reading is an active enterprise, and our voices should interact with that of the author. Anyway, I would like to suggest that you take some time during this less-than-ideal semester to memorize some poetry. I hope that once you have a bite of this literary peau de creme, uh, you will acquire the habit and become poetry gluttons. The thing is, you might not always have access to technology, uh, or you might want not want to use the, the technology that you have. You don't need it. If you memorize poetry, your mind can take you to ancient Greece or Rome, to medieval England or Renaissance England or 19th century France, wherever you want to go, poetry can take you there. And it does so in fine fashion. So one of the great definitions of poetry is uh, that poetry is thought condensed to the highest degree. It's a great definition. And one of the ways that poetry achieves that is through the use of imagery. It's one of my favorite aspects of, of poetry is the, the ability of a, of a really good poet to craft an excellent image in very few words. So I want to share with you just a few bits of the poetry that I've memorized throughout my life at various stages and uh, just uh, hope that you'll enjoy this and take it to heart. So the first thing I want to give you is a, a piece by Sappho, a 7th century BC Greek poet. And uh, I want you to listen to the sounds of this. I'll give it to you first in Greek and then in English, uh, in, an, in an English translation. Asteres men amphi kalan selanan apsapu kryptoi si phaenonedos 
opota play thoi samalista lampe gan epipasan. The stars around the beautiful moon hide away their light whenever she appears in her fullness, shining over all the earth. What an amazing description of that moment when one's lover walks into the room. Sappho has captured that moment perfectly, and part of the way she does that is through the use of long vowel sounds, long A's and O's that create the effect of an extended sigh. It's beautiful stuff, even though it's fragmentary, as all of Sappho's poetry is. Archilochus was a mercenary soldier, also Greek, uh, lived in the same century, probably the 7th century BC again, uh, and he wants to share a little bit with us about how he earns his living. So here is what Archilochus has to say. En dorimen moi madza memagmene, en dori doinos, ismarikos pino, en dori keklimenos. I earn my bread by my spear, and by my spear I earn my ismaric wine, which I drink leaning on my spear. Everything Archilochus does revolves around his duties as a soldier. He is, he, is, he is a military man through and through, and uh, he, he, he keeps bringing us back to that word dori, the word for spear. Uh, he keeps throwing that back at us. Everything he, he has, he has because of his abilities as a soldier. Jump forward several centuries here to uh, T.S. Eliot, the poet who got me into classics, and I'm grateful to Dr. Mary Mayer, a uh, professor of mine, an English professor I had, uh, who who helped me uh, come to grips with Eliot's verse, and I just loved it so much, and she took the time to explain it to me. So I want to give you a little piece uh, of the poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. This is from near the beginning, and again, just listen and let your um, uh, let your mind wander here. Enjoy this, this uh, particular image he presents us. The Yellow Fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house, and fell asleep. What an amazing personification of an everyday object. One of the great things that poets do is force us to look at everyday objects in a different way. Fantastic uh, description, the sounds, the, the images that we get uh, from Eliot's poetry are absolutely wonderful. Don't let anybody tell you he's too hard. He's not too hard. Great poetry can communicate, as Eliot himself said, uh, great poetry can communicate before it's fully understood. So how do we go, go about this, memorizing poetry? It's really simple. Just pick that short poem that you love, break it down one line at a time, or if one line is too much, part of a line. Just start with a phrase and keep saying it over and over again. Cicero uh, said it best, repetition is the mother of memory. Repetitio mater memoriae est. Uh, so you go through that first phrase, you keep saying it until you have it, you add in the second half, the second line, the third line. Every time you add a line, say everything you've done up until that point, and before you know it, you'll have that poem. Once you have it, nobody can take it away from you. It's yours forever. You can pull it out and enjoy that image uh, whenever you need to. So I hope you will uh, take that to heart. Uh, take some time to memorize some poetry, enjoy it, find poems that you love. There are all kinds of databases of poetry, the Poetry Foundation, uh, all sorts of places on the web that you can find uh, great poems to read and enjoy. So I hope you will take as much away from that and have as rich a life and full enjoyment of the poetic tradition as I have. Thanks and have a great day.